hello good afternoon hello. Uh, good, good afternoon, afternoon shambhavi good afternoon doctor yeah uh, so i just want to know what happened and uh, how many students are there which uh, where the presentations require judging uh i think uh, seven is there okay okay so if you can send me the list we can start who is first i don't have the list so you'll have to tell me who is first yes ma'am one minute i'll tell sorry students and uh, there was some confusion about the judging and i have joined in in place of whoever was supposed to come so i'll just find out what the list is like and then we'll start okay ma'am uh, first is aparna aparna okay we can start then aparna is here aparna atul atul kamath oh atul Guru kamath prasad who's here i can see atul is here atul you Arendra. want to start yes ma'am i'm ready with my presentation yes you can present yeah yeah thank you ma'am good afternoon ma'am is my screen visible yes visible yes okay uh, so my topic for today is a new approach in treating lipid dermoid and the subsequent astigmatism so the introduction for it Uh, limbal dermoid is the most common cause of limbal nodule in the pediatric population. It causes uh, irreversible loss of vision due to astigmatic amblyopia. So here we report a case a case where a six-year-old boy who presented with limbal nodule in the right eye led to astigmatism and reduced vision. So this is the history where a six-year-old boy came to us with a history of a mass in the right eye since birth. It was gradually progressive and painless. he also had decreased vision and foreign body sensation but there was no pain and bleeding in that particular boy on his visual acuity exam examination the visual acuity in the right eye was 1 meter finger counting with a correction of uh, plus 1.25 in the vertical meridian and uh, plus 4.25 cylinder in the horizontal meridian at 70 degrees but the left eye was uh, giving 66 vision any issues with the presentation uh, yes you want to share again you can just share again yeah yes sir This one, it one. I'll be sharing. Yeah, yeah. Time. Sure. Take your time. No problem. Okay. So coming to the surgical procedure, uh, he was diagnosed with the right eye conjunctival limbal dermoid, for which the excision of the dermoid was done under general anesthesia, and uh, the surgery went uneventful. So the intervention that we did was we used mitomycin of 2 mg, which was diluted in 10 cc of distilled water, and uh, out of which 1 cc of mitomycin was taken. so after all that after the preparation of mitomycin we took a cotton bud which was soaked in this 1 cc of mitomycin and kept it on the base layer after the excision of the limbal dermoid and after the this a thorough wash was given with this distilled water and a human amniotic membrane of dimension 4 by 3 mm was excised and it was sutured in that area with interrupted 60 wiping sutures follow up a patient is being follow up for around 4 months and is having a good clinical outcome and there were no side effects of mitomycin c like sterile melting and coming to the discussion complications of surgical excision of dermoid have high chances of recurrence and formation of pseudoterygium a combination of excision with lamellar keratoplasty and amniotic membrane and limbal stem cell transplantation has been advocated by pirozian in his study but to our knowledge there are very few cases where pediatric patients with dermoid resection has been done using mitomycin c so that is the place where we have intervened and in our case surgical excision was done of the limbal dermoid with placement of topical application of 0.0 to mitomycin followed by amniotic membrane transplant in that area a conclusion pediatric cases with limbal dermoid are prone to develop astigmatic amblyopia leading to irreversible loss in the patient usually the pediatric cases hence stringent measures are needed to excise it at the early stage and prevent recurrence or scarring therefore it is ideal to treat such cases with mitomycin c application further adding amniotic membrane graft to cover that bare area currently we have done only one case where we have done this particular uh, procedure and uh, two more other cases we have used the same procedure probably Uh, the follow up was uh, very less where it was only one month uh, follow up period so probably by the next fast one we would be able to have a case series of around 10 to 12 cases of pediatric uh, limbal dermoid where we used mitomycin c and amniotic membrane graft for the surgery these are my references 
Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Atul, what do you have to say about the literature? What does literature say about use of uh, mitomycin C for dermoid excision in pediatric age group? Excellent. Apparently, there are uh, very few cases. I think as for the literature, there were no cases where they're using mitomycin C. Man. So what we implemented was using the mitomycin for use for trap. We thought of uh, reducing the proliferation, which uh, which is a recurrence that happens as a complication. Man. So that's the reason why we're using mitomycin C. Okay. Uh, you didn't want to try without mitomycin C because that is what normally we would do, right? Uh, yes, Excision of the dermoid and um, amniotic membrane graft. So why why mitomycin C? Uh, first thing, man, because mitomycin C is already used and it has its success in uh, traps and also in few refractive surgeries where it helps in preventing uh, proliferation because of its antifibrotic activity. So other than this, I think uh, we can use the other uh, antifibrotic uh, agents. So that would be our next study, man, if okay. possible. Okay, okay. And what about the astigmatism after surgery? Yes, ma'am. Currently, the boy's refraction has improved to 624, and the uh, astigmatum is around just uh, one uh, diopter cylinder at 180 degrees, ma'am. Currently, one diopter. Okay. Yes, and uh, we are doing amyloidic amyloidic uh, treatment for the same, and he's on patch patching therapy for his left eye, ma'am. Okay, is it a syndromic okay. case? Syndromic case? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, only mm -hmm. had a solitary limbal dermoid, but no mm -hmm. golden heart syndrome to signs. Okay. Okay. Nice, and all the best for your future project. Thank you so much. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next presentation, Guru Prasad or Aparna, are you there? Na Narendra? Yes, yes ma'am. I'm there now, Guru Prasad. Okay, Hello. you can go ahead. Is slide visible, no? No, not yet. Good afternoon. Ah. Uh, my topic is an assessment of visual outcome with uh, rigid gas permeabilance in catechonic patients. Uh, uh, to introduction, uh, catechonic is a progressive non-inflammatory, non-infectious thing of cornea with concussive efficacy causing irregular corneal astigmatism without cellular incitation or sterilization. Coming to incident is 54.5 per 1 lakh population uh, seen in Asians in uh, four foot, younger at presentation. Uh, Dr. Minister. Guru Prasad, your voice is not clear. Can you just speak? Uh, Make sure it's all connected. Please. I'm audible now, ma'am. You're audible, but the voice is breaking. Something to do with your mic, I think. Presentation is fine. Are you hypoglycemic any, by any chance? <laughs> you can start then. We'll see. Uh, main object of the study is... Uh... Uh, to assess the visual outcome of patients with rigid gas permeable lens in catechonus patients. As, uh, it's a prospective cohort study. A total number of uh, patients are 50 patients, 94 eyes. Study period is between January 2022 or uh, July 2021. My inclusion criteria is the patients willing to give informed consent for the study. Diagnosed case of catechonus where visual activity is not satisfactory spectacles. Diagnosed case of catechonus post etria. An exclusion kit is patients with corneal opacity involving visual axis, patients with upper surface disorders and severe atopy, patients with corneal hydrox, patients who have undergone ketoplasty, patients not willing to be considered. Uh, come to methodology, patients fulfilling the inclusion criteria were enrolled for the study. Demography data and detail issue was taken, and complete ocular examination along with the workup for a ketoconus was done. All patients in the study underwent uncurative visual activity, best cut visual activity, retinoscopy. Sleep lamp examination and documentation of sleep. Diagnosis and staging of ketoconus in the male moderate disorder is done by using ketometry. Corneal topography is done by using pentacam. Selection of rigid gas permeable contact is basis of on on basis of manifest infection and degree of ketoconus. Patient fitting parameters are assessed and rigid gas permeable lens is uh, Coming to the observation, uh, most commonly it was seen in female on that one. Uh, 31 females had the ketones and 19 males had the ketones. Mean age of presentation was 22.34, preso minus 4.54 years. Uh, uh, among, four, among 50 patients, 44 patients had bilateral ketones and only 6 patients had unilateral ketones. Uh, coming to the uh, uh, severity, 24 patients had uh, mild ketones. 34 patients had uh, moderate ketoconus and 36 patients had severe ketoconus. 
त्या काय अनकट विजुअल ऍक्टिव्ह बर परंतु सिक्स्टी पॉइंट सिक्स्टी फोर पर्सेंट ऑफ आईस एट विजन बिटवीन सिक्स ट्वेंटी फोर टू सिक्स सिक्स्टी नाईन्टीन पॉइंट वन फाईव्ह पर्सेंट ऍट सिक्स सिक्स टू सिक्स एटीन फोर्टीन पॉइंट एट नाईन पर्सेंट ऍट फाईव्ह सिक्स टू थ्री सिक्स्टी अँड ओनली फाईव्ह पॉइंट थ्री टू पर्सेंट ऍट लेस दॅन थ्री सिक्स्टी बेस्कट विजुअल ऍक्टिव्हिटी विथ रिस्पेक्ट टू फिफ्टी फाईव्ह पॉइंट थ्री टू पर्सेंट इम्प्रूव सिक्स सिक्स टू सिक्स एटीन फोर्टी पॉइंट फोर्टी थ्री पर्सेंट ऍट इम्प्रूव सिक्स वन फोर टू सिक्स सिक्स्टी फोर पॉइंट टू सिक्स पर्सेंट इम्प्रूव बाय सिक्स्टी टू थ्री बाय सिक्स्टी and uh, with uh, rigid gas contact lens around around 98.90% had uh, improved to 66 to 68 only 1 to 1% had improved to 6 by 24 to 66 few studies done by zypetol and tazanspetol had shown significantly improved uh, visual acuity with uh, rgp than spectacles and in this study i conclude that uh, mean age of dentist is 22.34 for some is 4.54 years result had bell like presentation and there was a significant increase in visual acuity it has permeable lens and it can be one of the best moderate in visual acuity okay that's very interesting now uh, that's a re- a really very interesting and uh, you have managed very well so many cases and i think 94 eyes of 50 cases is a good number for a publication also are you planning to publish this study yeah ma'am yeah yes ma'am planning to publish this yeah i think so and what about the statistical analysis have you done uh, what tests have you used Ma'am, I I have not done statistical analysis. Yeah, that's what oh. I saw. I noticed that because in the paper it it brings more value to your results when you apply the yes. statistical tests and give up. Uh, if not anything, at least the p value, which is very impressive. So yes, you should you could do that and uh, try to yes. analyze uh, with age, uh, with uh, sex of the patient, and several other factors and the severity and all that. So yes, that will become more meaningful. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you ma'am thank you so okay much. next uh, aparna is not there right ainala is not there atul finished guru prasad finished. narendra 1240 ainala ainala is there narendra okay ainala you can present uh, okay ma'am thank you i'm sharing the screen now yeah please uh, good afternoon everyone good afternoon Uh, t- uh, so i will be presenting on correlation between central corneal thickness with the degree of myopia axial length and anterior chamber depth in uh, south indian population introduction myopia is reported to be a common refractive error in asian countries uh, it results from a complex genetic physical and environmental uh, factors the myopic changes of eyes involve increased depth of the anterior chamber elongation of the axial length thinning of the retina which is associated with lattice changes and decrease in thickness and elasticity of the sclera some studies have reported that myopic uh, patients have a thicker uh, central corneal thickness and others have found that the central corneal thickness is thinner in myopic eyes while some studies have support, uh, reported that there is no association between the central corneal thickness and the degree of myopia so our our aim of this study is to uh, determine the correlation between the central corneal thickness axial length ac depth and the degree of myopia materials and methods this is a prospective hospital based cross sectional study conducted in department of ophthalmology between june 2021 to september 2021 uh, so 60 patients uh, um, 60 patients were included in the in this study uh, like uh, 190 eyes one patient was one eyed uh, and uh, age was ranged from 15 to 55 years and patients with spherical myopia was taken from minus 0.5 diopters and uh, the exclusion criteria involved act- active ocular or corneal disease and corneal dystrophies a patient uh, who had been treated previously for glaucoma and ocular hypertension diabetics or other systemic diseases eyes with keratoconus previous corneal or ocular surgery and contact lens use for 2 weeks in case of soft lenses and 3 weeks for hard lenses so patients were divided into low myopia that is uh, less than 3 minus 3 uh, moderate myopia from minus 3 to minus 6 and high myopia uh, more than 6 complete ophthalmic evaluation and slit lamp examination was done for all these patients the axial length and ac depth of the eyes were uh, was measured uh, by ultrasonic a scan after installation of paracane uh, 0.5% into each eye and pachymetry was done for measuring the central corneal thickness statistical analysis was due uh, was uh, the was performed using statistical program for the social sciences version 16 and quantitative uh, parameters such as age were expressed in mean with standard deviation or median with interquartile uh, uh, range and categorical variables were expressed as percentage uh, 
So results, the mean age of the subjects was 22.82 uh, plus or minus 11.52. Uh, so we have taken from 15 to 55 years of age and there were 38, um, that is 63 percent of males and 37 uh, percent of males. And out of these, 50 um, percent were uh, uh, like low, uh, low myopia. Uh, 25% were moderate and 25% were high uh, high myopes and um, uh, refraction, mean refraction was minus 3.44 plus or minus 2 diopter spherical and the range was from minus 0.5 to minus 10 and CCT was uh, 540 um, plus or minus uh, 32 uh, which was ranging from 4 470 to 630 and axial length was 24 plus or minus 1, 1 1.5 and it was ranging from 21 to 30 and mm and uh, anterior chamber depth was 3.6 one plus or minus uh, 0.5 which was ranging from 2 to 4 mm so the correlations uh, were, uh, were the cct were, the cct was statistically uh, statistically significant with the higher degree of myopia and that is 0.07% and uh, low to moderate there is no uh, statistically uh, correlating with the low or moderate degree of myopia and it was uh, axial length is also uh, correlated with the cct and the AC, anterior chamber depth was not statistically significant Discussion. Muthu Krishnan et al. concluded that increase in corneal power is associated with increasing myopic refraction. Steeper corneal curvature is correlated with increasing axial length and thinner corneas. Uh, in his study, he told that there is thinner corneas in more than 10 diopters pericle, which, um, which was similar to our study in where the CCT was statistically significant with high degree of myopia, that is more than 6, uh, more than six diopters pericle, that is p-value of 0.07. And most of the earlier investigators have also found that anterior chamber depth in myopic eyes as compared to emetropic and hypometropic eyes like Chen and G et al, who found that eyes with more myopic refractive error tends to have deeper anterior chamber. Uh, but then in our study, we couldn't find any uh, statistically significant values of anterior, depth cha anterior chamber depth. And uh, Kosbeni et al study that 152 uh, adult uh, Saudis from 16 to 50 years of age that myopes had significantly deeper anterior chamber depth as compared to non myopes. In our study, we found no statistical significance with CCT and the anterior chamber depth. With an increasing axial length and myopic refraction, the corneal con uh, co conclusion with an increasing axial length and myopic refraction, the corneal curvature uh, tends to be steeper, and subjects with refraction of more than minus six diopter spherical had a, sig a statistically significant correlation with CCT. Uh, so there is a positive correlation between um, uh, mean CCT and axial length, and the mean CCT and anterior chamber depth has no statistically uh, significant correlation. These are my references. Uh, good study, a similar, study similar to one of my postgraduate student uh, dissertation studies. Uh, can you just go back to the inclusion exclusion criteria? Yeah. So you have included only all myopes, right? Only myopes, ma'am. Only so myopes. No cylinder. Correct. Yes, no, so and myopes. you have not included emetropes. You have not included hypermetropes. You have included only myopes. Correct. Yes, so go now yes, to the conclusions. Sir. Not not conclusion. The discussion slide. Yes, ma'am. So in the discussion slide, in the second point, you said that most of the earlier investigators have found higher values of ACD in myopic as compared to emetropic and hypermetropic. So the study is entirely different. The Chen study is entirely different in which they have compared yeah. anterior chamber depth in three different types of uh, refractive errors, refractive status, right? Myopia, hypermetropia, and emetropia. So you cannot com directly compare your study with this study because your study oh, group yeah. is entirely different. This is only within the myopic population. So you cannot say that, uh, you cannot compare and say that your study does not uh, have a correlation between there is no correlation between anterior chamber depth and uh, myopic refractive state. What is your comment on that? Uh, actually, my uh, I mean uh, this point, ma'am. Uh, mm -hmm. In our study, we actually compared with the uh, I mean the central corneal thickness with the anterior chamber depth, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So only in the myopes, we don't have any control groups here. Correct. So, Correct. Uh, yes. So what did yes. you find in your study? In that, can you go back to that uh, chart where you have compared? Uh, anterior chamber depth with this one. Yes, yes. Uh, so just try to interpret that. Uh, Ma'am, uh, here uh, the uh, central corneal thickness, it is statistically significant with the degree of myopia. I mean, with the higher grades of degree of myopia. Mm -hmm. But in the anterior chamber, it is uh, 0 0.7. That is, it was not statistically significant. Huh. So within mm -hmm. myopic group, 
there was no within difference in the anterior chamber depth. That is what your study says. Okay, so yes, you'll have to be very careful while interpreting your findings. Otherwise, it's a good study. Okay, done okay. well. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Can you go to the next? Can we go to the next? Yes, ma'am. I'm Dr. Narendra, ma'am. Yes, you can go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be starting the topic. Title is Factors Influencing the Age of Need of Press YP Correction. Chief author being Dr. Kavita Sivu, Professor and HOD, presenting author myself. Introduction. Press YP is a condition of physiological insufficiency of accommodation due to reduced amplitude, leading to a progressive fall in near vision. Usually, this process becomes perceptible beyond 40 years of age. It affects large number of people and it's easily treated by spectacles. It is a result of associated fatty errors, primary opening and nuclear sclerosis, and also uh, inadvertent use of alcohol and smoking. Uh, few ocular diseases such as glaucoma or trauma, removal or damage to lens, zonules, or ciliary muscle, and laser photocoagulation of retina may also lead to early press biopia. Aim is to analyze the factors influencing, influencing the age of need of press biopia correction. Patient diagnosed with press biopia in outpatient department of ophthalmology were studying during the study period of for two months. This is a hospital-based cross-sectional uh, study. Uh, period sampling is being done. Uh, is done. The study period is January 2021 to February 2021. Sample size is 50. It has no financial interest. Inclusion criteria. Patients complaining of near vision difficulty and those who are improving with plus lenses for press biopia. And patients with 30 years and more. Exclusion criteria, patient who do not give consent for the study, and patient with previous intraocular trauma, patient with previous intraocular or refractive surgeries, patients with retinal optic nerve pathologies and pregnancy are excluded. Methodology, data with respect to age, gender, occupation, socioeconomic status, education status, height, ratio of upper segment to lower segment of the body, arm length, substance abuse, usage of visual display units was taken. History of pre-existing refractive status also taken. Patient was looked for primary open angle glaucoma, nuclear sclerosis, and any ocular pathologies affecting near vision. Ocular examination includes uh, included measurement of distant visual acuity by Snellen chart and near visual acuity by reduced Snellen chart. Best character visual acuity was, was given. Pupillar reaction, anterior segment evaluation by slit lamp examination, intraocular pressure were done for all, the, uh, for all these patients. After pupil dilatation, posterior segment was evaluated with indirect ophthalmoscopy by 90D lens and slit lamp by microscopy we were using 78 or 90D lens. Coming to results, 40% uh, of the patients uh, lie in the age group of uh, 40 to 50 years of age. And in this 40 to 50 years of age group, uh, uh, out of uh, 20 patients are there, uh, out of 20 patients, 14 are males and uh, six, uh, 6 are females. These are gender distribution. 62% are uh, males and 38% are females. This is occupation. Uh, in our study, we came across system operators, farmers, drivers, teachers, and tailors. Uh, more affected are uh, system operators accounting for 36%. Education and socioeconomic status. 80% belongs to upper lower socioeconomic status. 40% uh, completed their degrees. 30% completed higher primary education and 30% uh, com completed their primary schooling. Coming to these anthropometry measurements, uh, height, coming to height, 24% uh, of females lie in the age group, uh, lie between uh, 151 to 160 centimeters and 46% female uh, males lie in the 161 to 170 centimeters. And uh, most of the uh, Patients uh, are in the lie between 161 to 170 centimeters, are more in the age group of 40 to 50 years. Coming to upper segment, lower segment ratio, 16% females uh, uh, lie between 0.85 to 0.9 ratio, and 26% uh, males uh, between 0.91 to 0.95, and 20 uh, patients lie in the age group 40 to 50 years of age. Then coming to arm length, 32% uh, of males and 18% of females uh, come in uh, between 51 to 53 centimeters. 
and 14 uh, uh, patients uh, lying in the between 40 to 50 age groups. Then uh, visual display units usage like uh, smartphones, systems. 54% uh, were using visual display units and 44% uh, with no visual display units. And 40, uh, substance abuse, 46% uh, uh, patients, all were males. 46% uh, were uh, uh, addicted, like alcohol and smoking, both. And nuclear sclerosis. In 24%, nuclear sclerosis was found. And in 6% cases, pre existing refractive, error, that is, uh, hypermetropia, was found. Discussion the study indicated higher prevalence of presbyopia in males, that is, uh, accounts for 62%. This correlates with the studies done by Burette et al. This study shows that 46% of males are in the range of 161 to 170 centimeter height and 24% of females in the range of 150 to 160 centimeter. This infers that short stature is a risk factor for early onset of presbyopia. And also 26% of males have uh, per segment lower segment ratio in the range of 0.91 to uh, 0.95 and 16% females in the range 0.85 to 0.9. This infers that lower uh, uh, Lower upper segment, uh, lower segment ratio leads to early onset of presbyopia. And also, 32% males and 18% 18 females have arm length in the range of 51 to 53 centimeter. This infers that lesser the arm length, earlier the onset of presbyopia. Occupations like system operators, farmers, trailer, teacher were in more need of presbyopia correction because of near, near work. Visual display units. Uh, users will have increased visual demand for near work and hence may be associated with early onset of presbyopia. Study in Nigeria by Bernie Settel emphasizes increased visual task as the main contributing factor for early onset of presbyopia. Farmers and drivers who have daily substantial sunlight exposure, that is less than 8 hours per day, indicates the role of ultraviolet radiation. Study by Mirinda et al. states that ultraviolet radiation and high average environmental temperatures can accelerate the aging process in lens, leading to early onset of presbyopia. A significant number, that is 46% of male patients had substance abuse like smoking and alcohol. Studies by Hafez et al. and Nirmalan et al. shows the association of substance abuse with the early onset of presbyopia. Conclusion, patient with uh, excessive use of visual display units need early presbyopic correction and patients with higher upper segment, lower segment ratio, height and arm length will require presbyopic correction in the late 40s. References. Maybe I didn't understand the study, but your aim was to find out what are the factors associated with early onset of presbyopia, right? Yes, ma'am. Then how yes. is that your inclusion is 60 years, 50 years? So for this study, I would have suggested that uh, we include only patients between 30 and 40 where at the time of onset of uh, presbyopia. How is it that you have included 60 years age? They came for the first time for presbyopic correction? Yes, ma'am. Can you just show the age uh, distribution slide? Yes, ma'am. So, so many patients, uh, 8, 6, and 2 in the above more than 60 years. These were the patients. In 40 to, in 40 to 50 age group, uh, there are most patients, 20 patients. Huh. Uh, in for 50 to 60, 12 patients, man. 30 to 40, uh, that is a premature presbyopic age, uh, 10 patients are there, man. Yeah. In the last, yes, that is more than 60 years, you said 8 plus 6 plus 2, so almost 16 patients no, came. No, ma'am. This huh? is 8, ma'am. Six, ma six males and two females, ma'am. Okay. 8 patients. 8 patients yes, came for the first time for presbyopic correction? Yes, ma'am. They had nuclear sclerosis grade uh, 1 and 2, ma'am. Those patients. Okay, so how do you know that uh, they never had presbyopic symptoms? Maybe they didn't require glasses, that's all. So have you analyzed that, the need for uh, near correction? Something is not uh, really clear about this study. Can you explain? Ma'am, they came for uh, for the first time, ma'am. Then to, uh, they explained like, uh, I'm not able to see the uh, near, uh, I'm not able to read the newspaper clearly. So what was the correction they required? Was it plus point, uh, sorry, plus one or was it plus three? Ma'am, plus 2.5, ma'am. Huh, so if it was plus 2.5, that means a presbyopia would have begun long back. Correct? Yes, 
So That's suddenly pa patient cannot have presbyopia of plus 2.5 diopters. That means they would have gone through all, several stages, That's plus nice. one, plus 1.5, plus two, and then they would have graduated to this stage. That That's means nice. they have presented late. They have, they have not early me. onset of uh, presbyopia. That's what I think. I okay. wish somebody else also could put some light on this. But uh, I feel there's some uh, deficiency in the clarity of inclusion criteria. So probably you should have uh, strictly said that who have recent yes. onset diminution of vision. So you said the patient's complaining near vision difficulty. Yes, yes. that can happen at 80 years also. Okay. Yes, but yes, your recent onset difficulty in your vision should have been uh, your uh, description for inclusion criteria. Uh, definition we have taken for inclusion. with the age 30 years and above. Ma. Above, above yes. means uh, 30 so, years is a minimum. Ma. And above, this includes premature presbyopia also ma, and late presbyopia also. Ma. Yeah. Okay. Fine. And uh, in this study, we uh, actually we mainly focused on these anthropometric measurements, ma'am. Yeah, that I got it, that I got yes, it. Yes, but uh, the main definition of uh, your inclusion criteria is not clear because you have included anybody who has come with the presbyopic symptoms, whether they have come at an early stage or late stage. Ma'am, so, uh, if a patient's complaint, uh, complaint of repeat, uh, come for frequency of uh, change, also we have included those patients, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Pre-existing refractory, I told ma'am, 6% yeah. of patients Correct. were having hypermetropia. Yeah, got it. So yes, if you have to publish this paper, I think you'll have yes, to do rework on your inclusion criteria. That's my opinion. Okay, anyway, okay. well done, well done study and something new that you have found between anthropometric measures and onset yes, of presbyopia. Well done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have the next speaker, Sahana 1404? I'll be sharing my video now, ma'am. Video or PPT? Uh, content, sorry, my PPT. Okay, yeah, sure. Sorry. Sure, sure, no problem. Are you able to? Uh, no, ma'am, I'm not able to. Can I just come back in a while, ma'am? Yeah, figure. sure. So, meanwhile, can we have uh, just a minute? Ma'am, can I present, ma'am? Who is, can I, Sahana? No, Abarna. Abarna uh, Basu. Yeah, Abarna, if your presentation is ready, you can present. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. One minute, ma'am. Yes. Is my screen visible, ma'am? Yes. You can start. You audible, ma'am? Yes, you are. Start. I'm Abarna Bas. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Abarna Baskar. I'm presenting that uh, paper titled Comparison of Smartphone Visual Acuity with Traditional Snellens Chart. We know that visual acuity assessment is important in diagnostic and prognostic evaluation of any ocular pathology. The what is the need of our study? This COVID-19 restriction and fear of contact and infection have made more people opt, opt for comparatively safer option of teleophthalmology than in-person hospital visits for non-emergency complaints. But the greatest barrier in teleophthalmology is finding a reliable and feasible alternative for Snell and Stat, which is the most commonly used visual acuity chart in the clinical settings in India. Few individual studies conducted found out that visual acuity measured by smartphone apps are comparable to the standard chart. But most of these studies are done in volunteers and their effectiveness in an actual patient is inconclusive. The reliability and effectiveness of most of these acuity tools in standard clinical setting or condition is lacking. So we plan to compare smartphone application, that is iChart in iOS platform, peak acuity in Android platform to uh, standard traditional cell and start, explore the possibility of using them as an alternative in teleophthalmology in current COVID-19 pandemic time. We did an analytical type of observational study on 360 eyes of 184 patients attending outpatient department of ophthalmology in a tertiary care center in South India from August to October 2021. We used a simple random sampling for the study. We included the patient people who are above 18 years of age and willing to participate. This included the patients with emetropia, refractive error, cataract, and pseudocopia, whose visual acuity was better than 6 by 60. We excluded the patients with gross ocular pathology and visual acuity less than 6 by 60. So we assess the visual acuity by three methods in a random order in a same room condition, room and lighting condition using tumbling knee optotype by a single examiner. First, uh, uh, self-eliminated Snellen start, we measured visual acuity at six meters. 
peak acuity, which was installed on Samsung Galaxy M30, measured visual acuity at 3 meters. iChart, which was installed on an iPhone SC, measured visual acuity at 1.4 meters. Visual acuity was assessed monocularly and with the uh, other eye occluded. Each test was repeated three times. Median value was selected and noted for the further analysis. Visual acuity measured converted into logmar unit for the ease of statistical analysis. Statistical analysis was done using IBM statistics software version 27. So after this 360 eyes uh, examined, mean age of the population was 39.59. Of them, 50.5 were females and 68.5 had educational qualification beyond matriculation. So this is the clinical and visual profile of the patients. 60% of the patients were immatrops and 27% were uh, refractive error and 10% were cataract and 3% were pseudophytic patients. Then statistical analysis for comparing eye chart, peak acuity and Snellens chart was used. We used one-way ANOVA with post uh, HST test to compare the three methods. So uh, when we done this test, we thought that there is no statistically significant difference in visual acuity measured using eye chart, Snell lens, and peak acuity. F statistics was 2.54 and p-value was 0 0.0793. And then we did a subgroup analysis for imatrops. The data was not uh, qualifying the criteria for ANOVA. So we went for crystal values test with post decay test. And the visual acuity measured by, we found that the visual acuity measured by peak acuity was not statistically different from Snell lens in any subgroups. But in eye chart, it was statistically different from Snell lens in uh, imatrops. Then to know the correlation between the peak acuity and eye chart with the Snell lens, we did intra-class correlation coefficient. We got the most of the values in this both groups in 0.9 and p-value was less than 0 0.001. And this indicated a strong positive correlation that both eye chart and peak acuity have strong positive correlation with the Snell lens chart. And this is the correlation plot that depicting the correlation between the eye chart and Snell lens and peak acuity and Snell lens. This uh, black line indicate the linear regression. Then to know the limit of agreement between the methods like Snell and uh, peak acuity and Snell and eye chart and Snell, we have done bland Altman plot analysis. For uh, plotting this one, we have first measured the mean uh, difference in visual acuity. Then 95 percentage limit of agreement was measured by plus or minus 1.96 standard deviation. So this is the bland Altman plot, what we got while uh, uh, this one. This is a correlation plot where the x-axis is average between logma equity between two methods and y-axis is difference between uh, the two methods. And the solid line, green solid line indicates the mean difference and the dotted lines indicate the 95 percentage limits of agreement. And from this pitch, uh, blonde, bland Altman plot, we can see that the trend of bias or the mean difference is positive in eye chart and negative in uh, peak acuity. And this mean difference is increasing, bias is increasing in uh, refractive error and cataract, uh, cataract patients. And we, if you are uh, seeing the trend of limit of agreement, we can see that in cataract and refractive error patient, this limit of agreement is more. When limit of agreement is more, consistency of the result with the is will be less. So in uh, there is less agreement in cataract and refractive errors. But in uh, they are all in a comparable range. So we can tell that bland Altman plot shows good limit of agreement for both eye chart and peak acuity with the Snell lens chart. Then we measured the visual acuity difference, mean difference in the visual acuity, and median difference in uh, median difference in visual acuity between eye chart and peak acuity with Snell lens was 0, 0.0 log mark. It was 0, 0.0 log mark for immatrops and eye with refractive error and cataract also. This chart show the trend of uh, difference in visual acuity measured by eye chart and peak acuity with the Snell lens chart. In this chart, we can see that percentage of patients showing no difference is more than showing difference in both the groups. And difference when present in eye chart is mostly positive. We can show the red line. Uh, when it is present in the peak of it is mainly the, uh, negative, uh, negative. And the percentage of patients showing the difference will be increasing in cataract and refractive error patients. 
So our studies show that there is no statistically significant difference in visual acuity measured by three methods: Snell lens, eye chart, and peak acuity. Pervers comparison also gave the same result. Eye chart and peak acuity show strong correlation and limit of agreement with the Snell lens chart. This is consistent with the previous studies done by Ansel et al. on uh, eye chart and Bastos et al. on peak acuity. Subgroup analysis showed that there is no statistically significant difference in visual acuity measured by eye chart and peak acuity with Snellen in eyes with refractive error or cataract, but in image drops they are different. But these differences are always in a comparable range. Comparing the trend of visual acuity difference, mean difference, limit of agreement, we can tell that eye chart slightly underestimate and peak acuity slightly overestimate the visual acuity compared to the Snellen chart. This difference is more pronounced in reduced visions like cataract and refractive error patients. In image drops, the visual acuity measured by peak acuity is more comparable to Snell lens than in eye chart. In eyes with reduced vision like cataract and refractive error, eye chart is more comparable to Snell lens than peak acuity. So what the advantage of our studies was done, our other studies it was done on patients attending OPD and it compares visual acuity difference in eyes with refractive error and cataract. The limitation is we didn't include the gross ocular pathology and visual acuity less than 6 by 60 and sample size for subgroup analysis were small. But in total, we can tell our study suggests that the smartphone based mobile apps, iChar, Peter PT can be used as an effective, reliable and feasible alternative to assess visual acuity in teleophthalmology, especially during this pandemic time. There is no financial interest. Thank you. Very good presentation. I think this is what is required during the pandemic times and you want to know uh, how, what is the visual acuity of uh, patients. So this is a very good option. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the only problem with uh, these technology-based visual uh, acuity assessment would be for those patients who don't have access to uh, internet or don't have access to mobile phones. So that would, and those are the people who will sit at home with visual problems. So I think that is one challenge that you'll have to look into. In your next uh, Coscon paper, you can include something on that. Yeah, we are planning like that, sir, ma'am. What, is, what yeah. is the plan? Like a subgroup analysis, we can do an extended study in refractive error with our... Okay, great. All yeah. the best for that. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Can we have the next presentation? I am ready, ma'am. Yes. Dr. Supriya. Dr. Supriya. Mm. Ah, you asked here, one right? Second. Okay, okay. Okay, yes, ma one, you can start. Yes, you, I can start. Okay. What's your paper number? Because your name is not I'm, here. I'm actually uh, F0, F1070, ma'am. It was included in optics uh, refraction section. Ma Contact lens are optic refraction. Yeah, FP? 1070, ma'am. 70, okay. Yes, ma'am. Can I start, ma'am? Yes. Good afternoon, ma'am. Yeah, good ma afternoon. Start. My topic, uh, my paper presentation topic is tell me causes of headache. Yes, sir. My slides are visible, ma'am. Yes, yes. Okay. Please start. Yes, ma'am. Uh, introduction. Headache is one of the most important causes of disability worldwide. Even a common complaint. It is often misdiagnosed and inadequately treated. Headache is multifactorial in origin. Possibility of the ocular causes of headache should always be kept in mind during the management of the case of headache. Due to the close link between the eyes and the headache, an ophthalmologist plays an important role in establishing the correct diagnosis and management of the headache. The objectives of my to estimate the proportion of patients with headache in ophthalmology outpatient department to determine the various ocular causes of headache. Uh, coming to the materials and methods, it is a descriptive cross-sectional study. An institutional ethical uh, committee clearance was taken and all patients who presented with headache for ophthalmology OPD were examined. And th those with ocular causes were enrolled for the study. Visual acuity, reclamp examination, autorefractometry, fundus examination, wet retinoscopy were done. And after three days, post midriatic testing and correction was given. Gonometry and gonioscopy were done in the required cases. And patients with non ocular causes of headache were referred to the medicine, psychiatry, or any other concerned departments. And the data was analyzed using, using SPSS uh, statistical software. 
coming to the results in our study on an average 50 patients presented with a day cabriment to our OPD in about 50 to 20 percent 20 cases were found to be having causes of headache and, and that proportion of ocular causes of headache was found to be 35 percent In our study, the patients in the age group of 16 to 30 years are more commonly affected and it is about 47% and females are most commonly affected than, than the males and it is about 69%. And uh, our refractive errors are the most common causes of headache in our study and uh, astigmatism causes more headache followed by the hypermetropia. And uh, coming to the other causes of ocular headache, like the primary open angle glaucoma, primary clo close angle closure glaucoma, lens induced glaucoma, and glaucoma suspect, and papilledema in five cases, exotropia in five cases, esotropia in one case, and UVAT in the two cases. Among the refractive er errors, uh, out of 180, 180 cases, 118 cases had a refractive error with the fi final correction of less than one diopter. And uh, refractive errors, astigmatism is the most common cause of headache. Going to the discussion, in our study, the proportion of ocular causes of headache was found to be 35%. And uh, Shashi Jain in their study also reported that uh, a proportion of ocular causes is 6%. In our study, the incidence of headache was slightly higher in refractive errors. It is about 68.9%. And 18.8% uh, in press biopia, and other causes like about 12.12% in muscle imbalance and uh, anterior and posterior segment abnormalities. And similar findings were observed in the Shashi uh, in the st study done by Shashi S. Jain. Uzma Fais also reported that 14.78 of press biopics add headache. The reason for higher incidence of headache in uh, refractive errors like astigmatism may be due to the involuntary sustained excessive accommodative efforts, which put the eyes under the strain. In our study, there were eight cases of glaucoma in that two were open angle, three were uh, lens induced glaucoma, and two were angle closure. And seven cases of glaucoma suspect, five were papilledema, exotropia in five cases, and one was esotropia, and two were UVATs. Kimbo in their study also reported that 12 patients with anterior segment diseases such as glaucoma and UVATs are associated with headache. Any inflammatory disease of the eye and acute rise of IOP may cause pain in and around the eye and can also cause headache. In our study, there were 65.6% uh, 65, 65 of the patients with refractive error less than one, one diopter and 22 patients with, refract, uh, with uh, re refractive error between 1.25 to 2 diopter. Similar observations were uh, reported by Shashi Jain Griffith, who stressed that, uh, who stressed that uh, small astigmatism errors were responsible for more severe ocular asthenopia. Coming to the conclusion, headache due to ocular problems is very frequent. So during the management of a case of headache, ocular causes should always be kept in mind. Patients with headache are to be investigated to rule out eye-related disorders, especially for the refractive errors and the binocular vision anomalies. Proper diagnosis and correction of refractive error plays an important role in the management of the ocular headache. These are my references. Thank you, ma'am. Just one question. Yes, uh, you said a la large proportion of these patients with headache were refractive errors. Yes, ma'am. Have they, most of these patients were uh, visiting your hospital for the first time with headache and not yes, suspected for it before? No, no, ma'am. Most of them came with the complaints of headache rather than the blurring of vision, ma'am. Mm -hmm. In astigmatism, they were, they were presented with headache, but after diagnosing, like after doing vision and all, we came to know that they were having uh, astigmatism, ma'am. So they were not already wearing glasses no, or no, contact no, lenses? No, ma'am. No, okay. ma'am. They are all uh, like new cases only, ma'am. Okay. 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 Fine. Well done. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, can we have the next presentation? Yes, um, sir. Sahana is it? Yeah. Yes. One four zero four. Ma'am, is my PPT seen? Yes. You can yes, start. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon to the respected panelists and my fellow colleagues, uh, ophthalmology colleagues. Today I will be presenting a free paper uh, titled "Correlation Between Interpupillary Distance 
inner outer canthal distances and limbal distance a cross sectional study under the guidance of Dr. Sheetal Ma'am and Dr. Vittal Sir. Introduction Interpupillary distance is the distance between the center of the two pupils. IPD can be of two types the anatomical IPD between the two pupils or physiological IPD, which is distance between the two visual axes of both the eyes. IPD is also defined as the distance between temporal limbus of one eye with nasal limbus of the other eye. Inner intercanthal distance is the distance between the point where the upper eyelid meets the medial canthus and not the caruncle. Outer intercanthal distance is the distance between the lateral canthi with the patient looking in primary gaze. Clinical importance of these parameters. There are various interorbital distances which are important in studying the orbitofacial configuration and more so in prescribing a correct spectacle and selecting an appropriate spectacle frame. There are various fields including ophthalmology, optometry, oculoplasty, genetics, and traumatology where the knowledge of IPD has its importance. IPD forms one of uh, IPD forms one of the most important measurements for calculating interorbital distance or distance between eyeballs, which can be calculated by various ways, but it is difficult to measure in children, uncooperative patients, and those having severe deformities. So the aim of this study was to find the correlation between the IPD, the inner canthal, outer canthal distance, and the nasal limbus of right eye and temporal limbus of the left eye distance, and to use these measurements in deriving a regression equation and comparing them with the IPD values. Methods used, 100 study participants, uh, sorry about that, uh, 100 study participants were randomly selected from individuals attending the outpatient department at a tertiary care hospital. IPD was measured using the autorefractometer and the pupillary distance meter, the images of which are displayed to you, and all other measurements like the inner intercanthal distance, outer intercanthal distance, right nasal limbus to left temporal limbus distance were measured using a transparent plastic ruler. A total of 100 subjects, including 40 females and 60 males, were randomly selected and included in the study after taking a well-informed consent. Data was entered in the MS Excel sheet and analyzed using the SPSS version 19. Multiple linear regression was performed to find the factors associated with IPD and a p-value of less than 0 0.05 was considered as statistically significant. The results were, uh, there was a positive correlation noted between the various measured variables. And in our study, the mean IPD by autorefractometer in females was 60 millimeters with a standard deviation of 2.5 and in males was 64.5 with a standard deviation of 2.57 millimeters, which was clinically significant. There was a similarity noted to a certain extent between the inter inner canthal to outer canthal distance between the two eyes and the interpupillary distance, which indicate that it's a better variable to approximately conclude regarding IPD measurements. But there was a much stronger correlation noted between the nasal limbus of right eye to temporal limbus of the left eye, and thus it could be concluded that this measurement can be used to deduce the IPD with a strong correlation coefficient. In conclusion, interpupillary distance is an important uh, measurement in various situations like studying congenital craniofacial anomalies, post-orbital trauma, and most importantly in optical industry, where even a little mistake in the same can cause significant reduction in the quality of image and can lead to development of various types of abrasions, including spherical, chromatic, coma abrasions, etc. Hence, measuring IPD can be aided by regression equations as calculated by our study, especially in some special situations like pediatric age group, uncooperative patients, specially challenged individuals, and in periphery community camps using other easily measurable interorbital variables but the gold standard of using the auto refractometer becomes a challenge. These are my references. Thank you for your patient hearing, ma'am. Yeah, that's very good uh, analysis. And can you go back to the statistic slide? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So uh, what has happened is we missed a lot of your uh, uh, content of the slide, which was at the bottom. I think it's a PDF that you're presenting. 
uh, there was some technical issue. Yeah, with I could make out. Okay. No graphs. Uh, no, man. Graphical representations I have. Because those correlations are better seen with graphs, right? Yes. So the R value and all. What was the R value? R square. You didn't include that in your presentation? Uh, no, I haven't included it in the presentation. Okay, okay. Okay, no problem. Yes, but a good presentation. Well Thank done. You. Okay. Thank you. Okay, can we have the next uh, speaker now? One second, I'll have to see who it is. Again, Sahana, 1558. Sahana is here. Sneha is here, 1215. Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Okay, can I start? Sneha, you, yeah, you can start. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I'm not able to share the screen. It says disabled. Someone else is sharing. No, I can see your screen, Sahana. Short term effects it's... of mobile and laptop gaming. On I am Sneha. Okay. Should I present next, ma'am? I'm Sneha. Yeah. Okay. Who's presenting now? Sahana is presenting, is it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Present, present. Oh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, the title of my study is the, start, uh, the Short Term Effects of Mobile and Laptop Gaming on Binocular Vision. Introduction Binocular single vision is perceived when there is coordinated movement of both the eyes so that dissimilar images arising from each eye is fused together. It is a result of both the motor and sensory processes. There is some evidence in literature reflecting the functional changes in the eye following screen exposure. With the increasing use of mobiles and computers for everyday purposes, as well as for leisure activities, it is important to determine the effects of digital screen on binocular vision. Hence, this study was conducted. Aim of the study was to estimate the effect of computer and mobile games on the binocular vision function. Objective of the study was to compare the binocular functions between uh, mobile and laptop video games. Methodology. The study was conducted on the students of medical college. Study duration uh, was, uh, the study was conducted from January 2021 to July 2021. The sample size was 60. Uh, it was a type of prospective observational study. Inclusion criteria, all emetropes uh, with the visual active more than or equal to 6 by 6 and N6 with clear media within the age group of 18 to 25 were included in the study. Exclusion criteria, any diagnosed ocular diseases or ocular motor abnormalities. Methodology, a total of 60 individuals aged huh? 18 to 25 no, it was not, not were involved in this. I didn't do the study. Share the screen. Share the screen. Share content. Requesting the other participants. It's muted, ma'am. Please continue. Yeah. A total of 16 individuals aged 18 to 25 years were involved in this prospective study after the inclusion and exclusion criteria were met. Such individuals underwent a baseline binocular vision assessment. Their binocular vision was reassessed once after playing one hour of the Asphalt 8 game on mobile and was once again reassessed on another day after one hour of gaming on laptop. The assessment included sensory motor accommodation and virgins tests. Results of the study. Of the uh, 60 participants, 25 were males and 35 were females. The result uh, showed that there was statistically significant increase in the amplitude of accommodation, accommodative facility, and near point convergence with accommodative target after playing the game on mobile. There was statistically significant increase in near point convergence with accommodative target and near point convergence with non accommodative target as well. Also, there was statistically significant increase in virgin's facility after playing the game on laptop. There was statistically significant decrease in stereopsis with a p-value of uh, 0.011 after playing game on mobile and the p-value of 0.027 after playing game on laptop. Discussion. The effect of video games on various binocular functions is higher because these devices are kept at a closer distance from the eye. So it demands for more convergence and accommodation. Effects of video games on vision, visual function in children 
study was done by Misawa et al. suggested that regulating the playing time to less than or equal to 60 minutes per day is necessary to prevent negative health effects in children. Uh, the current study result shows that there is significant differences between the tests before and after playing game in mobile and laptop, which may be because the participants were asked to play game for prolonged time, that is accommodation and convergence demand was high for prolonged time. Also, there was not much of a difference between the effect of mobile and the effect of laptop, which is because the working distance was same for both the devices. Conclusion of the study. It is is concluded that playing game on mobile and laptop for one arm may harm the binocular vision. Also, there was no statistical difference in the binocular assessments between mobile and laptop. Limitation of the study, only the short-term effects have been studied and the effect of only one playing session was considered in the study. These are my references. Thank you. Okay, so what is your advice to all of us? Uh, so we have to limit uh, gaming or the use of uh, display terminals to less than 60 minutes per uh, day yeah, but and then... also uh, advisable to take frequent breaks. So the session is going on for more than one hour and before that two hours of uh, judging. So it's already three hours for me. <laughs> so what do you expect? <laughs> to happen in my eyes yes, after frequent the <laughs> laptop work. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I think in the pandemic, all of us are going through this problem. So we'll have to find a bigger, better solution for yes, this. Ma yeah, chalo. Yes. Uh, well done. Okay, we'll go to the next uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, Sneha is ready? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you can start your presentation. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So I'm presenting a paper on an observational study on axial length and its correlation with degree of myopia using A scan ultrasonography. Uh, the chief author is Dr. Shashank Sajjan Shetty. Myopia is a type of refract refractive error wherein parallel rays of light coming from infinity are focused in front of the retina with accommodation being at rest. Myopia being responsible for around 75% of refractive error related complications with serious social and economic consequences is a major threat for visual health across the world. Axial length is the primary determinant of refractive error compared to other ocular components. Yeah, I think Sneha, your anything. slides are not moving. It's not moving. Okay. One second. Yeah. yeah. It's an introduction now, ma'am. Hmm. Yes. Okay. So axial length is the primary determinant of refractive error compared to other ocular components such as crystalline lens and cornea. The correlation with refractive error is larger for axial length than for any other component. The correlation between change in axial length and progression of myopia is also quite high. That is about 0.77 to 0.89. Uh, the high frequency ultrasound using a 10 megahertz sound probe in an immersion technique enables measurement of axial length of the eye within an accuracy of 0.1 millimeters. A mode ultrasound is performed using a 10 megahertz probe, which allows a resolution of 200 micrometer and a longitudinal clinical accuracy of 100 to 200 micrometers. The purpose of this study is to establish a correlation between axial length and degree of myopia using A scan ultrasound. This study was carried out for a period of 10 months from November 2020 to August 2021 on 75 randomly selected patients visiting ophthalmology OPD for diminution of vision. Inclusion criteria were all patients above six years attending the ophthalmology OPD and the exclusion criteria were any patients below six years of age or patients having index myopia or defects in the lens or cornea, uveitis or other infections of the eye, astigmatism or pregnancy. A detailed history was taken. Patients' unneeded vision and pinhole improvement was determined using Snellen's chart at a distance of six feet in a dark room. Wet retinoscopy was done with either homatropin, cyclopentolate, or tropicamide eye drops, depending on the age group of the patient. Subjective correction was given after three days, and the patients underwent a detailed slit lamp biomicroscopic examination and fundus examination. Keratometry was done, followed by A scan, and axial lens were also measured. A mean of three readings were taken with a difference of less than 0.1 millimeters. Uh, the observations of uh, the myopic eyes in different degrees of myopia showed that 51 eyes with uh, 0 to minus 3 diopters accounting for almost 
which is followed by 44 rise with minus 3 to minus 6 diopters accounting for 29.33 percent uh, the correlation between axial length and the degree of myopia showed the widest range in minus 12 to minus 15 diopters uh, with 27.32 uh, to 32.36 millimeters uh, incidence of myopia depending on the gender was that female patients uh, were more in this case where 48 cases were there uh, percentage was about 64 percent and the uh, range of degree of myopia in different age groups where the widest range was in 21 to 30 years of age of minus uh, 0.5 to minus 23 diopters followed by 31 to 40 years and 51 to 60 years and the smallest range was seen in 6 to 10 years with minus 1 to minus 4.5 diopters it was noted that uh, 0 to minus 3 diopters constituted the largest number of myopic eyes with 34% followed by minus 3 to minus 6 diopters which is 29.33% and the least number of myopic eyes were constituted by a degree of myopia of more than 21 diopters which was 2.66%. It was observed that the axial lens showed a variation from 22.41 to 32.82 uh, millimeters with the mean axial length increasing with the degree of myopia. The least axial length of 22.41 plus or minus 0.62 millimeters was seen in less than minus 3 diopters myopia and the maximal axial length of 31.97 plus or minus 0.98 was seen in more than 21 diopters of myopia. It was seen that myopia was more common in females than males and the widest range of dioptric power of uh, minus 0.5 to minus 23 diopters was seen in 21 to 30 years of age group and the smallest range was seen in 6 to 10 years age group which is minus 1 to minus 4.5 diopters. So myopia is a refractive error which presents in both genders in all age groups. The leading cause of myopia is increased anteroposterior diameter of the eye and it is regarded as the primary determinant of refractive error. According to literature, myopia prevalence varies with age, gender and race. Bino et al. showed a quadratic relationship between axial length and age and reported that the average axial length for full-term infants increases from 16.8 to 23.6 millimeters when they become adults. And we found that the mean axial length increases with the degree of myopia increases. It was least in patients who had myopia of 0 to minus 3 diopters and the highest in patients having myopia of more than 21 diopters. This is also in line with published literatures, which indicate that the axial length is the largest determinant of refractive error. The longer the axial length, more severe is the myopia. Olsen et al. found that the axial length explains the majority of variation of refraction in populations. Renz et al. also reported that myopia occurs slightly more frequently in females than in males. Why Bart Dion et al. in his study re uh, revealed that the female gender is statistically significant risk factor for all three levels of myopia. This is also in line with our findings. In our study, majority of the patients had low myopia that is less than minus three diopters. This was followed by patients that is 44% with moderate myopia of minus three to minus six diopters in patients with high myopia and the remaining patients and very few patients that is 2.66 had a myopia of more than 21 diopters. In conclusion, this prospective study on 75 eyes carried out over a period of 10 months hereby concludes the following. The incidence of myopia is more common in females than males. The axial lengths of myopic eyes vary from 22.41 millimeters to 32.82 millimeters and a positive correlation is seen with degrees of myopia. There is an increase in the axial length with age. The highest degree of myopia was seen in 21 to 30 years of age followed by 31 to 40 years and 51 to 60 years of age and the mean axial length increases with increase in degree of myopia. These are my references. Thank you. Uh, good study, but in the age group of 50 to 60, you could also have yes, some amount of index myopia. So have you tried to rule out that? Or have you- Oh, yes, ma'am. Hmm. Yes, ma'am. All patients who had a uh, nuclear sclerosis were not included in the study, ma'am. It was only pseudophagic individuals in uh, that age group. In pseudophagic individuals, the refractive error is corrected. Whatever refractive error is there is corrected with IOLs, right? So how do yes, you correlate the refractive status with the axial length then? Because there's an additional factor there, that is the IOL power, which, yes. is, which after biometry you have corrected, right? Yes, ma'am, after biometry. Yeah, so even in a, um, axial, when the axial length is, say, 30 millimeter, and there's high myopia, and you have corrected with an IOL, and the patient is now e-metro. You cannot put yes, tropia and say that 30 mm uh, 30 millimeter axial length is associated with myopia, right? So you have to exclude yes, patients with pseudophagia. Okay, ma'am. Correct, right? That was not done. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that wasn't done. And uh, one more thing, yes, any, any unilateral cases of myopia you have? 
Yes, ma'am, urinary cases were also there, but that was low myopic, ma'am, less than minus three diopters. No uh, severe asymmetric uh, myopia. No, ma'am. Okay. Asymmetric myopia was not seen in moderate and high, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Well done. That's only. Part. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So, well done. Then we have, I think, one last presentation now. A cross sectional study, uh, 1277. Ah, yes, ma'am. Um, ma I'll start sharing my screen, ma'am. Yes. Is my screen visible, ma'am? Yes, it's visible. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Today I'm presenting a paper on a cross sectional study of correlation of macular parameters with severity of myopia using HDOCT. Introduction, myopia is defined as a state of refraction in which parallel rays of light are brought to focus in front of the retina with accommodation at rest. In high myopic patients, clear ectasias are relatively frequent and involve the posterior pole of the eye, leading to poor visual prognosis in adult life. Uh, the risks of retinal detachment, chorioretinal atrophy, pigmentary degeneration, and posterior cephaloma also increase with the severity of myopia and increase in axial length. The traditional methods for evaluating such changes in the fundus are not sensitive to small changes in retinal thickness and are qualitative at best. With the advent of uh, OCT, it has uh, uh, allowed the clinicians to reliably uh, detect and measure small changes in macular thickness and to quali uh, quantitatively evaluate the efficacy of different therapeutic modalities. Purpose to study the correlation between average uh, central foveal thickness, parafoveal, and perifoveal macular thickness with severity of myopia using HDOCT. Variation of axial length with degree of myopia was also analyzed. Materials and methods, inclusion criteria, patients with myopia more than one diopter and age more than 18 years. Exclusion criteria, patients with previous history of intraocular surgeries, media opacities, uh, patients with other uh, ocular or systemic diseases that could affect the macular area like dystrophy, uh, ARMD, diabetic retinopathy, uh, patients with, uh, unable to fixate or not cooperative for OCT examination and patients with astigmatism more than two diopters. Uh, this is a cross-technical study done on the patients attending our OPD with a sample size of 75 eyes. Informed consent was taken, detailed history was obtained, complete ophthalmic evaluation was performed, which included visual acuity by Snellen's charts, uh, detailed anterior segment evaluation, cycloplegic refraction, diluted fundus examination was done by plus 90D lens. Axial end measurement using A-scan biometry, ZSHD, OCT uh, using macular cube uh, 512 into 128 protocol was used for measurement of the macular parameters and post mediatic subjective uh, refraction uh, refractive uh, correction was done. The 75 eyes were divided into three groups, group A, group B, and group C. Uh, uh, group A had mild myopia, minus one to minus three diopters, group B moderate, minus three to uh, minus six, and group C high myopia, uh, more than six diopters. Coming to the results of this uh, study, the gender distribution was male, uh, males were 58% of the study group and females of 42%. Um, the amount of my uh, uh, According to the degree of myopia, the um, mild myopes of 42.7%, uh, moderate myopia in 50.6%, uh, and uh, high myopics was 6.7% of the study group. Uh, axial length in relation to severity of myopia, here uh, uh, average uh, axial length in mild myopes was 22.53, in moderate 23.42 mm, and in uh, high myopes it was 24.99. So uh, there was increase in axial length with the degree of myopia, the p-value was 0 0.001, which was statistically significant. Uh, mean central thickness in relation to severity of myopia, uh, there was an increasing trend with the uh, increase in degree of the myopia. However, it was not found to be statistically significant. Com on comparison of mean macular thickness, that is parafoveal between the three categories of uh, uh, myopia, there was decrease in thickness noted in the superior and the nasal quadrant, uh, which was uh, high in the um, higher degree of myopias. When comparing uh, similarly, uh, Perifoveal thickness between the three categories of myopia, thinning was noted in uh, superior and nasal quadrants, and it was found to be statistically significant in higher degree of myopes. Coming to the discussion, on comparing the axial length with the degree of myopia, we found that the mean axial length increased with the severity of myopia. Nancy Elizabeth Samuel et al. in their study had the mean axial length of higher myopes, which was uh, significantly higher compared to the moderate and low myopia. 
on comparison of mean macular thickness parafoveal between the three categories of myopia we found there was thinning noted in the superior and nasal quadrant in the higher degree of myopia according to a study done by uh, lim et al their study showed that the point of maximum retinal thickness on either side of the fovea decreased with the increasing axial length whereas the minimum thickness corresponding to the foveolar uh, thickness increased Similarly, on comparison of mean macular thickness perifoveal between the three categories of myopia, thinning was present in the superior and nasal quadrants, which was found to be significant in the nasal quadrant. This study shows that overall average macular retinal thickness does not vary with the increasing myopia or axial length. This correlates with the results of other similar studies. Vakitani et al. in their study found no statistically significant difference between the average thickness in emetropes, low myopes, mildly and high uh, myopes in three regions, central parafoveal and perifoveal. Lim et al. studied 130 ophthalmically normal men, 19 to 24 years of age with myopia, who underwent examination of one randomly selected eye. They concluded that average retinal thickness of the macula does not vary with myopia. However, the parafovia was thinner than the fovea, uh, than the fovea uh, thicker with myopia. To conclude, the average macular thickness of the fovea did not vary significantly with the degree of myopia. However, significant perifoveal thinning was present in nasal quadrant with increasing degree of myopia. Structural changes occurring in myopes is irreversible. So screening with a rapid, non-invasive, non-contact technique like OCT provides early detection and interpretation of any pathologic changes occurring at the macula like thickening or thinning of the retina. Uh, these are my references. Thank you. Yeah, a good study. I have just two questions, two quick questions. What is the clinical significance of knowing that uh, the superonasal part of the perifoveal uh, area is thinner in high myopes? Uh, Ma'am, uh, hmm. uh, it can also correlate uh, uh, myopia with the glaucoma, ma'am. Like uh, there will be some uh, RNFL uh, thinning, ma'am, in uh, that quadrant, ma'am. So. Hmm. Okay, and in some what proportion of your cases had myopia? Some of them had uh, glaucoma? Uh, uh, glaucoma, we had not correlated, ma'am, in this one. Okay, but uh, there were cases of glaucoma in your study? Uh, no, ma'am. No, okay, fine. And the second question is, how many of them had posterior cephaloma? Uh, um, uh, none of them had, ma'am. We had not so included you, any. You had excluded. That was an exclusion criteria, or they it were just not, not an there. Exclusion. We didn't get, ma'am. Uh, we have not uh, excluded it, uh, but we didn't get it, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. Well done. Thank so you. We, we have one more last presentation, and that is by Shweta. One three one zero. Is she there? Shweta is there. Uh, am I audible, ma'am? Not so clear. Uh, now am I audible, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, you are audible, but not so clear. Okay, you can start presenting. No, not yet. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself, Dr. Shweta. Uh, I'm presenting uh, my paper uh, is Hanging by Threads, a case series of ectopia lentis. I have done the study under Dr. Madhuri Paramitre. Introduction, ectopia lentis is a dislocation or displacement of the natural crystalline lens. It can be either subluxated or it can be luxated. Luxated is also called as dislocated when it is completely outside the hyaloid fossa. Uh, the lens is considered to be subluxated when it is partially displaced but remains within the lens space. Now, ectopia lentis can occur after trauma or it can be associated with any ocular or systemic diseases. As ectopia lentis may be the first sign of more serious systemic diseases, it is important to determine the etiology for the proper patient management. Now, complications of ectopia lentis could be a significant refractive shift like myopia, uh, due to which there can be retinal damage, retinal um, uh, detachment, pupillary block glaucoma, which will lead to uh, blindness. Now, the systemic diseases which are associated with ectopia lentis are the most common being Marfan syndrome, Marfan syndrome uh, is the most common cause of heritable ectopia lentis and ectopia lentis is the most frequent manifestation, ocular manifestation of Marfan syndrome. In Marfan's, usually the dislocation of lens is bilateral, superotemporal direction. The second most common cause is homocysteinuria. 
homocystinuria uh, is associated with intellectual disability and uh, osteoporosis. The enzyme deficiency here is uh, cystathionase beta synthase. Uh, lens dislocation. Yeah, go ahead. Hello, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. This patient in homocysteinuria is usually bilateral and in 60% of cases it occurs inferior and nasal. Another uh, a systemic associ disease associated with ectopia lentis is wheel marchesani syndrome, which is a rare genetic disorder which is characterized by abnormality of lens, uh, short, age, short stature, brachycephaly, and joint stiffness. The ocular manifestations in wheel marchesani could be microspherophagia, ectopia lentis, and uh, the eye disease that causes damage to the optic nerve, like. Uh, glaucoma, which can further lead to blindness. Other systemic diseases associated with ectopia lentis is sulfite oxidase deficiency, hyperlysinemia, uh, and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Uh, objective, here in my study, I'm uh, reporting five cases of ecto ectopia lentis with varied systemic association and how we have managed them both ophthalmologically and other general management. Methodology, case one. Here we have a 15 year old girl who presented with diminution of vision in both eyes since two years. She, on examination, she had a vision of counting fingers three meters in both eyes uh, be, be, with pupils being reactive. And an anterior segment here as shown, if there was inferonasal subluxation of lens with iris pigments on the capsule. On fundus examination, there were myopic changes and uh, axial length also correlated. Right eye was 27.6 mm uh, and left eye was 26.86 mm. Keratometry was showed 42.00 uh, diopter vertically and 42.25 horizontally in both eyes. Objective refraction was done for her where it should hold minus five diopter sphere in both eyes through the phagic portion, that is uh, this portion, and the plus 10.25 diopter sphere through the aphagic portion of the pupil. So subjective acceptance was minus 4.5 diopter sphere in the right eye and minus 3.75 in the left eye with the visual activity improving to 624 from counting fingers three meters. Now there was no improvement in visual acuity with the AFAK correction, so we had gone for the FAK correction. General physical examination in, in her uh, showed all uh, features which were suggestive of Marfan's, like tall, tall stature, wrist and thumb sign positive, uh, reduced elbow extension, malar hypoplasia, and high arched palate. We had sent her for physical systemic examination where 2D echo and echo uh, and ECG suggested myxomatous mitral valve prolapse and mitral regurgitation. Next, moving on to case two, we have two brothers uh, aged 12 years and eight years who presented with superotemporal subluxation of lens as shown here. Vision was counting fingers three meters in both eyes in the elder one and younger one had fairly good vision of 6.9 in right eye and 6.12 in left eye. Uh, fundus of both the patients showed myopic changes. Now, in uh, the elder child, objective refraction suggested right eye of plus nine um, diopter in the aphakic refraction part and uh, left eye suggested minus three uh, diopter sphere in the phakic part. Subjective refraction in the elder child was done where the child improved to plus seven diopter uh, lens in the right eye and minus three diopter in the left eye phakic refraction. But here glasses was prescribed only for the left eye and the younger child was managed conservatively. Both these children also again had Marfan syndrome features like uh, wrist sty and thumb sign positive, reduced elbow extension, uh, facial features. Here we have the third case. Here again, the child had Marfanoid features, nine-year-old girl who presented with diminution of vision in both eyes, uh, vision being six by 60 and anterior segment showing inferonasal subluxation of lens with iris pigments on the lens capsule. So objective refraction showed minus 13 diopter through the phakic portion and plus 18 through a phakic portion. Uh, subjective acceptance was minus 12 in uh, right eye and minus 10 in left eye with visual acuity improving to 624. So we have given her a fakey correction. There was no improvement in visual equity with the a fakey correction. Here for case four is a 12 year old boy who presented with painless diminution of vision. He had a anterior segment superior nasal subluxation of lens in both eyes. 
again object, objective and subjective ref, uh, refraction showed minus nine diopter sphere in right eye and minus eleven diopter sphere in le uh, in left eye through the phacic portion and play of uh, through the phacic portion it was plus eighteen diopter. Now these this child had only uh, bilateral high myopia and ectopia lentis. So this uh, diagnosis of simple isolated ectopia lentis was made. The child was sent then for a uh, general physical examination, physician reference also was taken, but uh, there were no uh, pediatric reference was taken, sorry. Uh, for, but there were no features suggestive of Marfan's uh, and or homocysteinuria. Case five, uh, here we have a 43 year old male who reported with painless progressive diminution of vision. I think we lost connection with her. Shweta, are you back? Hello, ma'am. Can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I think you lost connection. Yeah. Yeah, there is some problem in slide share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can continue. Yes, yes. Can you see now, ma'am? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this patient had an IOP of. Uh... Hello, ma'am. We can hear you. We can hear you. Shweta, are you there? Can you hear me, ma'am? Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, this patient, 43 year old male, he had also, he also had bilateral small spherical crystalline lens, suggestive of microspherocytia, which sets idoneal, causing interotemporal subluxation of lens. So here we can see there's a golden ring uh, due to reflection of light uh, uh, from 360 degree periphery of the small crystalline lens, causing interot uh, and setting on the idoneal, causing interotemporal subluxation in both the eyes. Quantus examination of right eye had shown glaucomatous optic atrophy. And uh, in this patient, the AC was relatively shallow with the angle, uh, AC angle in right eye being grade 2, 1 hertz and grade, uh, in left eye being grade 3, 1 hertz. So the IOP was high, uh, 28 and 20 mm. Uh, Keratometry showed a 43.30 uh, diopter in uh, and 44.30 diopter for right eye and left eye respectively. In this patient, objective and subjective refraction was done. Objective refraction showed minus 4.75 diopter sphere with minus 5.5 uh, diopter cylinder in right eye and left eye shows minus 3.25 sphere and minus 5.25 cylinder. And subjective correction in right eye was minus 3 diopter sphere and left eye was minus 4 diopter sphere. Now, since we had also other... Uh, I think, Shweta, we lost your uh, voice again. Okay. Hello, ma'am. Yeah, just conclude without the slide. I think there's some problem with your uh, connectivity. Uh, can you see the PPT? It's a very interesting PPT, but <laughs> something is wrong with the internet. Now, ma'am? No, we are seeing something else. Yes. Uh, can you see now? Ma yeah, we can see you. Yeah, we can, we can see the presentation. Yeah. Uh, so coming to the results, in case one, since, we have, since the patient had significant, uh, uh, can you hear me? Okay? Yes, yes. Yeah, since the chi uh, child had significant lens subluxation and include with uh, uh, minus 4 diopter sphere in right eye and minus 3.75 in left eye with a complete, uh, with a visual activity of 624 in each eye. So there was no improvement with a correction, so we had given safety correction for him. In our case two, Elder child had improved with plus seven diopter in right eye and minus three diopter in left eye. Again, phacic correction was given. Uh, even though uh, in right eye he had improved with uh, a phacic correction, uh, he he was more comfortable with uh, the phacic correction of minus three. And uh, so glasses was prescribed for the left eye only. And the younger child was managed conservatively. In case three, uh, again for Fakey correction was given. Objective, uh, subjective acceptance of minus 12 diopter sphere in right eye and uh, minus 10 diopter sphere in left eye with visual effort improving to 624. In case 4, which was the isolated case of ectopia lentis, uh, there was improvement with minus 9 diopter sphere in right and minus 11 diopter sphere in left. Again, fakey refraction only was done. In the case five, which is the case of real Marchesani syndrome, uh, there were, the visual diagnosis is demo, uh, visual prognosis is dominated by secondary glaucoma due to pupillary blockage by the microspherophacic lens. 
So in this case, uh, the patient was advised lens extraction in the left eye in view of shallow AC, but the patient had refused to undergo the same. So we had to put him on uh, anti-glaucoma medications that is Imalol and Brimonidine. Um, and uh, refractive correction was uh, given for him. So patient had improved with minus three diopter lens in left eye and no improvement was there in right eye because of uh, optic atrophy. Uh, discussion, most of the cases of ectopia lenses in children uh, are, are children who are in the process of growth of ocular structure and development of visual activity. So therefore, clinical decision of either observation or surgical intervention is crucial for the follow-up of children in, uh, with ectopia lenses because in order to avoid amblyopia. So lensectomy is required in children who have developed the aphasic optical axis due to the deterioration of the lens ectopia in the follow-up or uh, who have ab abruptly developed lens dislocation to the AC after blunt ocular trauma. Children with ectopia lenses have been followed up. So like all our cases, we were had followed up to check their presence of uh, ectopia lenses in, lens in the pupillary area and to measure the visual activity and intraocular pressure. The optical use of lens in the periphery uh, in ectopia lenses will result in uh, astigmatism as well as high-grade myopia. So in our cases, spectacles were prescribed based on cyclocleusic refraction and visual activity was examined for both near and distant. Full correction was not necessarily sought for a large degree of astigmatism or for high-grade myopia since later on uh, they'll be having myopic shift so, uh, they, and they are habitual under the accommodators. So rather, uh, emphasis was placed on the reading uh, distance at near viewing uh, when the glasses were prescribed. Conclusion, the management of ectopial lenses is challenging uh, both for the ophthalmologists and uh, pediatricians as well as general physicians. So a multidisciplinary uh, team should be involved in managing associated disorders, achieve good vision and prevent amblyopia and sight threatening complications. The primary treatment is to implement a conservative approach by giving glasses or contact lenses. And surgical intervention is, cons is not considered unless there is an evidence of any uh, complications. Uh, these are my references. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was a very extensive presentation. And uh, I think you, uh, now I, uh, IGO is accepting case series also. Should go ahead with the presentation with the publication of this uh, article because you have a lot of information and very yes. well documented uh, cases. Yes, and you have covered so extensively. I don't think I have many questions. Yes, so uh, with that, yes. we'll we'll make a yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, all the participants, and uh, very well done. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So we'll log.